Hey y'all, my name's Tyson. Today, let's talk about 3D printing. So many of you will probably be familiar with this concept, but if you have not tried uh, 3D printing, what we're gonna talk about is some tips for taking your SketchUp models to 3D printing software and 3D printers, and just some general guidelines or considerations that uh, that you should keep in mind. So let's get to it. So the first thing to think about when you are 3D printing is that you wanna send a solid object to the 3D printer. This is a pretty generic shape, but if we look at the entity info, it registers as a solid group. Now, if we went into this and just drew a line, that would make it non-solid. Now that line probably won't interfere if we actually exported this, but there's a lot of things, certainly missing faces, that will cause problems. So just keep in mind that you wanna create 3D solid objects. Just make them groups or components. If we look over here, for example, if I look at the x-ray mode, we can see there's some stuff in here, extra edges, extra surfaces going on. Various ways to make this a non-solid. So in the follow-up video to this one, we'll look at some of the extensions out there, such as the solid tools extension that will help clean this up. But generally, just keep that in mind that you wanna create solid objects. So that's principle number one, pretty straightforward. Um, the principle, the second one that I want uh, to show, let me show that under model info, my current uh, default units are inches. And if I export this as an STL file, so if I export as a 3D model, STLs, uh, one of the default export options, I want to go into the options and make sure that I'm exporting this uh, as millimeters. Most of the software out there, slicing software, will prefer millimeters. If you export as inches, it might convert it for you or it might bring it in <laughs> as, uh, you know, um, at the wrong scale because of this. So I have found generally this helps change this to millimeters, and then test it out. I've already exported this out. Let's have a look at what this would uh, come across as. Now this is Ultimaker Cura. Um, I'm not, uh, this, we're not partnered with them or anything. This just happens to be a good all-purpose slicer, but any slicer, of course, will do the same thing. So our object is brought in. We could move it around on the bed, but ultimately we're just going to slice this. Now, there's a lot of settings in here. 3D printing, um, you can go deep into the weeds based on the, the materials you like to use and, and a number of factors. Let's just create a pretty generic PLA 0.4 nozzle slice. And then if I preview this, it's gonna give us kind of an idea of how it would build this up from the base and build it up with a lot of interior supports. And that's how it would print. And it would take nearly six hours for this particular print. So let's look, go back. That's the basics. You just take your model, you export it as an STL file, import it into your slicing software and then slice and send it to your printer. Now let's look at a few other considerations when you're in SketchUp creating a model. These are both from some um, skill builders that we did in the past few months. This one was on a skill builder using booleans. If I were to create this with the solid tools, a number of uh, subtractive and additive boolean functions at this scale, there might be some problems as I build it. It might 
result in some missing faces. And here's another example of that. If I took this model and I want to create a little bevel around the base of it, so I'm going to select this surface, use the follow me tool. Okay. And I'll do the same in here. In this example was from our follow me. And we showed there as well that this is pretty small and there's some gaps in here. When you're dealing with really small geometry, SketchUp doesn't always resolve all of those gaps. So you want to keep that in mind as you're building models. So let me undo that. Now, there's a couple ways to deal with this um, where you scale it up. I could scale this object itself larger by a known factor, let's say 10, and then I'd scale it back down 0.1. But this is a component, so I could also just make a copy of it, move it over here, scale up the outer version of this to anything. And then I'm going to come back in here, use follow me. And by doing it on this larger version, you can see that it actually works just fine. But I'll delete that because it was a component. It happened also on our uh, real scale and it actually resolved it correctly. This is commonly referred to as the Dave R method. So we, you know, thanks as always to Dave for sharing this in our forums. Just remember that if you have a small object and you're having trouble with the details, scale a copy of it or a copy of it if it's a component or scale it up by some known factor and then scale it back down. But things work better when bigger, but you can still make that work for you. So that's the, uh, the idea of go big. All right, let's talk about nozzle size. By default, and we're talking about filament FDM type printers here. By default, printers are gonna come with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. That's pretty standard. It's a good balance of, you can, Get a print done in a couple hours, but also have a fair amount of detail. But you can change those out for larger nozzles, so a 0.6 or 0.8 nozzle. So with that in mind that you can have different nozzle sizes, you may want to build your models at some you know close factor of that. And in this example, I've got all of these boxes in this sort of grid system. And the walls of these boxes I've made one millimeter thick. And if you think about 0.4, a 0.4 size nozzle, then it will take roughly two beads of plastic to fill a one millimeter, or at a 0.8 size nozzle, I could do it with one. And in fact, that's what we'll see. So let's take a look at this. I've exported this out as an STL. If we come back to our slicing software, and import that box. Right now I've got a 0.4 nozzle. So if I slice this, this box is going to take uh, over eight hours to complete. And indeed we can see why, because it's got to go along each of these walls twice. It's got a lot of infill to, to do. If I instead printed this with a 0.8 nozzle, now we've cut the time in half. And in fact, we could go into the, the settings here and reduce the amount of, of filler and we could get this time down even lower. But the main point is that with a one millimeter wall modeling that, then I know I'm gonna get you know, one bead at uh, 0.8 nozzle. So just keep in mind that, that you may want to keep your nozzle size and your modeling size and keep a relationship between them and for some, predict some predictability when you come on over here. Uh, and these boxes work fine. We won't go into the weeds of materials. 
PLA, if you were printing this, you might have some concern with separation, whereas I printed some boxes out of PETG and had really good success. But that goes into the weeds, uh, the weeds and the fun of 3D printing. But there you go. Keep in mind that you can change the nozzle size of your 3D printer and you know, use extrude more or less filament and that you may wanna consider that in your model uh, window. Another consideration with nozzle size is how much tolerance uh, or how much space you need to create for your models. And what I mean is this, in this example, this is a marker holder for a CNC machine so that this attaches to a CNC and this can move up and down and this holds markers and you can draw. Um, it's not my original idea, this is just my version of that idea. Not only do I want this piece to be able to move in this chamber up and down, and we put a spring up here, but also the print itself is not exact. So I want to make sure that the wall of this piece has a little bit of room between the wall of this chamber. And again, not just for movement, but also because the printer is going to have a little bit of variability. So this was modeled with a little bit of space. And it was modeled with a little bit of space oops, here on the top so that once this is enclosed, again, it has a little bit of space to move. Here's another example of that. If I move this piece in, this piece slides in here, but you can see it's not meant to touch the bottom here. It's meant to have a little bit of space on these sides. And then this would be a friction fit that, that slides in here. So again, keep that in mind. You need to model, if you have interlocking pieces, you need to model with some idea that you're creating a little bit of a tolerance because the print sizes are not exactly perfect and that will vary based on the novel nozzle size um, again a 0.8 would give you a little more variance that you'd need to account for whereas a 0.4 would be a, a, a more precise model but of course take more time all right now another concept to think of when you're 3d printing is how you send the file so let's say i've modeled this I could select all of these pieces and send this file over, but it would come across something like this. Um, this version we can see was broken out a little bit, but I, it, when I exported, I selected all of these and exported them as one file. Now I'm going to have to go through and it treats this as sort of one model and it, it's, it's kind of going to be kind of a hassle to fix this. But there's no need because I could simply have from the start either exported these out as separate pieces or laid this out in SketchUp like this where they're all sitting on the ground and then I could export them all out and import them and that's going to work much better i don't have to fix anything about how this sits on the model another thing that uh, you'll become very familiar with as you enter the world of 3d printing is the idea of supports and the idea that you're going to want to orient your pieces to minimize supports so this piece could go to the printer, right? It's going to be used like this where it's vertical, but I could take it vertically. I could take it like this. I could take it like this. And in the printer, it's going to have to print supports for all those places that have overhangs. So even at a 0.8 nozzle, 
Let's slice this. And in here, it's not showing supports. Let me make sure that under, so I'm gonna say generate support. There's settings for how much of that. But this is, this is what we'd be seeing. In order to print, for example, this overhang or the lip under here or this, it's going to have to print supports to build up to it. And as best you can, you will learn to avoid supports, not only because it takes more time and material, but because you then have to go in and clean all of this out and, uh, and clean it up. So keep in mind as you're learning to 3D print that you will want to, regardless of what your piece is supposed to be at the end, which is this version. This version is the best one for printing because it has, it minimizes supports. So I would export it like that. All right. One last concept that we can cover here and then we've dragged it out long enough. It's the idea that often for 3d prints, you will create little bevels. And that's, that's a great, that's, that's a really nice piece to add. When you do, you may want to consider whether you are creating angled bevels and chamfers or whether they have a radius. And I apologize if I'm using my words a little incorrectly, the idea of bevels and chamfers and radius E and all of this, but let me show an example of why. Keep in mind that for these bevels, the you know the slope here is consistent whereas what happens for a radius is the slope starts to be more and more basically of an overhang so when we look at that in our software or as we prepare it for a 3d printer You see what's happening under here is we're getting farther and farther away. Even um, we're being shown that this bead of filament is going to leave a gap here and a gap here. And the gaps won't bind together. And this is going to be a problematic area of this print. And that doesn't entirely have to be on an overhang. It can also be down here as well. Whereas if we use just a straight a ramp, then we're going to have more consistent results. Now that's not to say don't ever use a radius. It's just to say, be aware of this and, uh, and you may not want to take it all the way or just have other considerations. If we had more layers in here, that might help remediate that as well. Just something to be aware of and to experiment with. All right, that was a whirlwind of throwing different concepts at you. Hopefully it was helpful though. I know we didn't actually take anything to a 3D printer. As you saw, actual prints take hours to, to go. But once you export that STL file, then you can slice it up and then from there, uh, run it to your 3D printer. So many possibilities, 3D printing uh, opens up. It is a lot of fun. If you are brand new to it, prepare to be frustrated a little bit uh, or a lot bit, but the barrier to entry really is better now uh, than even just a few years ago. Machines are far more reliable. Uh, the price keeps coming down for better and better machines. It's pretty fun, but you will do some experimenting based on the type of models you create. So just be that, you know, mentally ready for that. With that said, let us know um, what you think about you know, 3D printing, 3D printing in your own industry or your own world, what you use it for. Um, 
we'd love to have that thought. Let us know if there's other things that you want us to see in these videos. And like I say, hopefully in the next video, we will look a little bit at some of the extensions that will help you prepare your models for 3D printing. Otherwise, like and subscribe if you haven't. And as always, have a great day. We'll see y'all later.